Our patient population is primarily patients with respiratory diagnoses who are transferred from the ICU for ventilator weaning and rehabilitation. These patients are monitored for telemetry or pulse oximetry or both. We wanted to examine ways to reduce alarm fatigue by eliminating clinically irrelevant and non-actionable alarms. We originally assumed this would focus on cardiac alarms, but after collecting the data for the alarms, we found that the pulse oximetry alarms had the highest percentage of red alarms. So we decided um, after some collaboration with the pulmonologist and the respiratory therapist to, um, and looking at the data, looking at um, a lot of research that's been going on, um, that we could lower our low limit of SpO2 to 88%. Another thing we had to do, I believe, was just to set the parameters, because then when we decided, um, for instance, with the pulse oximetry, we wanted to decrease a lower parameter, there was a hard stop, and it was already had, um, had a, a, a range in there that we couldn't just change for everyone to start out at that default. It was a default range. Mm -hmm. And we really wanted to see a decrease of maybe 10% in our alarms in total, and then at least 10% decrease in the amount of SPO2 alarms. And actually what we found was we got like a 40% drop in those alarms when we dropped um, our SPO2 low limit to 88%. I think I've had for years an intuitive sense that the alarms weren't an effect, you know, weren't being effective. They were often triggering when they shouldn't be. Um, and so one of the things that was interesting was to see all the data, to actually see mathematically and graphically um, what alarm fatigue looks like by the numbers. And I think that was very powerful data. And then, the, you know, the idea of changing our set point and then, re, you know, being able to do it uh, in a safe way and then monitor for its effectiveness was very appealing. I think that the, that the research-based aspect of it, the empiric-based aspect, you know, I'm going off now. Um, <laughs> so the, uh, you know, being able to do it in a scientific way uh, was a very powerful uh, approach. Um, this effort was, um, you know, multidisciplinary. Um, I really feel like it came from the frontline providers, so the respiratory therapists um, and the nursing teams, and they brought it to the attention of the physicians. Um, and uh, my role was to at least um, reflect what the general medicine docs are doing, the hospitalists, um, but then to engage the pulmonary docs uh, in how they felt, what their comfort level was and making sure that everybody was on the same page and everybody had buy-in. Well, to get buy-in from the organization, what we did was we tried to marry some real life stories. The Joint Commission had a lot of resources of um, events that have happened across the country related to alarm fatigue. Um, some were patient deaths, some were harm. So we started by sharing some of that information to kind of make it more of a reality of what could happen if you ignored an alarm or did not address it appropriately. Really the question became, how can this be more effective? How can we achieve our goal better? Um, and so I think this involved nursing, respiratory, physicians, really a, a team-based effort to figure out how we can better achieve our goals. What we do is we're aggressive. Um, we have uh, rounding meetings every day where we round on every single patient. All parties are involved, physical therapy, um, respiratory therapy, nursing, um, nutrition, pharmacy, they're all involved. So. Everybody knows the goal for the day. So when we do something, everybody's on the same page. I think it's essential to just lay it level the field. I think it, making sure everyone feels comfortable speaking up. There may be something that a nurse who's had the patient, known the patient longer than I have has something important to contribute and making sure that they feel comfortable, you know, bringing that information out on rounds. If I make a decision that they think should have gone it differently, that they feel comfortable saying something, um, that respiratory feels like they can speak up, and that really the plan shouldn't come from just one person, but should come from sort of everybody's input, because I think everybody has something important to contribute to the plan for the patient. Um, our huddles are something that the charge nurse does at 11 a.m. We gather our staff, all of our staff, from nurses, respiratory, and CNAs, and we talk about hot topics. And the alarm fatigue uh, education is definitely one of our hot topics. And huddles are only about seven minutes long, so we like to get in, get the hot topics going, and 
have any questions if needed, and then get out and continue our day. And in the huddles, I also will always make sure we ask all the respiratory and the nursing and the CNA if there's any um, clinical concerns with any of the patients that we need to be aware of. And also just pointing out to the staff that everyone is responsible for the alarms, not just nursing, yes. respiratory, CNAs, anybody walking by, everyone is responsible to respond to alarms. And not at the nurse's station, but in the patient room. Right. Alarm fatigue is real and nurses do, and all staff, they do get desensitized to the monitors, but it's very important to check your patient because you never know when um, an alarm is going off and a patient is crashing and you need to assist your patient. So it's very important to, like Heather said, check parameters and make sure that the patient has all that they need, but it's also very important to check the patient and to address the alarms at all times.